great academies of the rabbis were established and thousands of new laws formulated. There, those same Pharisees who killed Jesus Christ remained the undisputed rulers of Judaism. In Babylon, the Pharisees codified their oral traditions into the Babylonian Talmud, the written form of that oral tradition which Jesus so bitterly rebuked. The Talmud reveals how deep was Israel's apostasy. The Talmud also helps us understand the basis for Christ's unflattering descriptions of the Pharisees. Jesus described the Pharisees as hypocrites, children of hell, blind guides, whited sepulchers, full of dead men's bones. He even described the Pharisees as children of their father, the devil, a murderer from the beginning. The Talmud confirms Christ's words. In the Talmud, in Treatise Sanhedrin, an extensive passage describes the right of the Pharisee to kill anyone, just as long as he did so indirectly. As one of dozens of examples, the Talmud tells us that if one bound his neighbor and he died of starvation, he is not liable to execution. In such an indirect manner, the Pharisees also killed Christ. Manipulating the Romans to actually wield the spear and sword, the Pharisees claimed, as their descendants do today, that since the Romans were the direct cause of the death of Christ, it is the Romans, not the Jews, who are guilty. Christ also called the Pharisees adulterers, an adulterous generation. The Talmud provides generous loopholes for adultery. It says the penalty for adultery does not include sex with a minor, the wife of a minor, or the wife of a heathen. The Talmud also encourages seduction of unwed adolescent girls called designated bondmaids. But it's important how such rapes are performed. With the designated bondmaid, one is guilty only in the case of natural connection, but not in the case of perverse connection. The Pharisees reason that rape in a perverted manner is outside the jurisdiction of the law. Normal rape, however, was punishable. In Babylon, sexual perversion of every kind had been a way of life for millenniums. The Pharisees were deeply influenced by such practices. In three of the major treatises of the Talmud are found extensive passages which give legal endorsement to seduce and marry three-year-old baby girls. In fact, many of the greatest rabbis of the Talmud, including Simeon ben Yohai, upheld this privilege. Today in Israel, thousands of Jews go to Meron every year to venerate the memory of Simeon ben Yohai, one of the most respected rabbis in the history of Judaism. In one of dozens of endorsements of child sex, Simeon ben Yohai said, a proselyte under the age of three years and a day is permitted to marry a priest. Agreeing with ben Yohai, the great rabbi said, when a grown-up man has intercourse with a little girl, it is nothing. For when the girl is less than this, three years and a day, it is as if one put the finger into the eye. The footnote to this passage says, As tears come to the eye again and again, so does virginity come back to the little girl under three years. The same section confirms that sexual activity with small boys is in the same category. The intercourse of a small boy is not regarded as a sexual act. In addition to adulterers, Christ, in the story of the Good Samaritan, portrayed the Pharisees as racial bigots, too self-righteous to respond to the suffering of one who was not a Jew. It is true, because of the wickedness of the Canaanites, which included sodomy and infant sacrifice, Israel had been commanded by God to be harsh in her treatment of the inhabitants of the land. God made it clear that the Canaanites were not simply to be avoided, but destroyed. By the time of the New Testament, this method of preserving God's kingdom by separation and the sword had become obsolete. God no longer made a racial difference between men. But the Pharisees were unfazed by God's new agenda. The Talmud was finally written down nearly five centuries after Christ. Yet its critical, even homicidal attitudes toward Gentiles might have been lifted out of the book of Joshua. However, the quickest way to grasp the Talmudic view of Gentiles is not directly from the Talmud, but from the Jewish encyclopedias. If we quote an isolated opinion from the Talmud, 
a rabbi may quickly object, saying, but that is not the overall opinion of the Talmud. That is not the definitive view. What the Jewish Encyclopedia provides us is a definitive overview of perhaps hundreds of rabbinic statements on any subject, giving us accurate summaries of what the Talmud generally teaches. In its article on Gentiles, the Jewish Encyclopedia begins to define what makes a Jew so different from a Gentile. According to the rabbis, only Israelites are men. Gentiles they class not as men, but as barbarians. Since Gentiles are not men in the fullest sense, so the Gentile is not a neighbor of a Jew. Further, since Gentile laws were too crude to admit of reciprocity, meaning too crude to be taken seriously, the Gentile was forever beneath the Jew. Gentiles were outlawed by God from the beginning and thus had no property rights. The Almighty offered the Torah to the Gentile nations also, but since they refused to accept it, he withdrew his shining legal protection from them and transferred their property rights to Israel, who observed his law. Since the Talmud outlawed the child, or issue of a Gentile, as that of a beast, a Gentile had as little legal rights in a Jewish court as did an animal. The Talmud states that if a Gentile sue an Israelite, the verdict is for the defendant, the Israelite. Conversely, if the Israelite is the plaintiff, he obtains full damages. Because the Talmud conspires against Gentiles, if a Jew was ever caught telling a Gentile what the Talmud really says, such a person deserves death. So vile was the nature of a Gentile that the great Simeon ben Yohai said, the best among the Gentiles deserves to be killed. The best of snakes ought to have its head crushed. Jews, however, are exalted beings in the Talmud, worthy of praise. Christ described the Pharisee who blessed himself, saying, I thank thee, Lord, that I am not as other men. An eminent Talmudic rabbi says the same. Blessed be thou who hast not made me a goy or a Gentile. There is a special antagonism between the Talmud and Jesus. The Talmud attacks him everywhere it can, even his mother. Mary, the Talmud says, was a whore who mated with carpenters. She who was the descendant of princes and governors played the harlot with carpenters. It naturally followed that the scribes declared Christ to be a bastard. In its article on Jesus, the Jewish Encyclopedia says that Jewish writings defame Christ. It is the tendency of all these sources to belittle the person of Jesus by ascribing to him illegitimate birth, magic, and a shameful death. Jesus, according to this article, was considered one of the three worst enemies of Judaism who came to an ignoble end. The Talmud says they subjected him to four deaths, stoning, burning, decapitation, and strangling. The Talmud also says he is now in hell, punished with boiling hot excrement. What is Christ's advice as he speaks to us out of hell? The Jewish Encyclopedia quotes Jesus as telling us above all to bless the Jews. He says, Further their well-being, do nothing to their detriment. Whoever touches them touches even the apple of his eye. Christians, as followers of the false prophet Jesus, also deserve death. The Jewish Encyclopedia again recaps the Talmud's position. A Gentile observing the Sabbath deserves death. The testimony of a Christian was not admitted in evidence in Jewish courts, and an Israelite who found anything belonging to one who was a Christian was forbidden to return it to him. The Pharisees, through their Talmud, thus gave the Jews an ethic which encouraged bigotry and isolation. But it did worse than that. It invited persecution. By the 11th century, the inhabitants of Babylon, growing weary of the self-righteousness and dishonesty of the Jews, expel them to the West. That's part of our faith. They had to read uh, the Bible, the Torah. And that carried the Jewish people as a unique people, people of the book, as we call it. The people of the book not only knew the book, they could read the book. The capacity to ask questions, which is what 
the Talmudic tradition did across Jewish communities. It never defined the end of knowledge. It never put an exclamation mark on truth. It was constantly questioning, expanding, growing, exchanging between communities, between great scholars and their students. It never ended. It was always iterative. This culture exploded when the walls of the ghetto went down. This same tradition, this same culture is part of us. It's deeply ingrained in our culture, in our thinking, in our traditions. Israel's fight is our fight. We are one. We are united. We will not be discouraged. We will not be defeated. We will not be intimidated. We will not sit down. We will not be silent. We are the worst nightmare of the anti-Semites of the world. The victory is going to be ours. I don't care. Good. I, I hope the Jews did kill Christ. I'd do it again. I'd fucking do it again in a second. Leave. What? You, you, need to, you need to, you can't come in here. This is, a, this is a, not your house. This is not your house. We killed Jesus and we brought him. We're gonna kill you and the Palestinians. This is my house. This is my land. God gave it to me. And fuck you. When they circumcise little boys, the rabbi actually puts his mouth around the penis and sucks the blood. I am not making this up. This is Talmudic Damn. Judaism, and this is what is being carried out in Israel. So for those who want to support Israel, especially the idiot Christian Zionists, my God, how stupid are you? These people hate Jesus Christ, and they definitely are using you like a bunch of idiot pawns for their own sick and twisted game. That is the reality. Absolutely.